Welcome to the ASOL Human Rights Interest Group's Roundtable, Black Lives Matter and International Human Rights Law, the Challenge of Systemic Racism. This roundtable has two objectives. First, it will draw on diverse social science research to explore the origin and operation of systemic racism in the United States that gave rise to the Black Lives Matter movement. And second, the roundtable will analyze how international human rights law obligates states to address these systemic problems. Our session will run exactly one hour until 2.45 p.m. Eastern time. And please join us afterwards for a 30 minute CTC continuing the conversation event. Um, on the ASOL online program, there's a button for uh, the CTC that you can click on to join. My name is Zachary Kaufman and I'm the moderator of this event. I teach at the University of Houston Law Center and next academic year will be visiting at Washington University and St. Louis School of Law. Along with the recently elected Ignacio Alvarez, I am the co-chair of the Human Rights Interest Group. Our interest group's outgoing co-chair is Aaron Felmuth, and our ongoing vice chair is Jill Goldenziel, who is herself the immediate past co-chair of our interest group. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank profusely um, uh, Professor Felmuth uh, for everything that he's done to put this roundtable together. It's his brainchild. Um, and he uh, is credited for inviting and should be credited for inviting our speakers. We're, we're extremely privileged to have four uh, very distinguished roundtable members with us today. Because of their backgrounds and accomplishments are so extensive, and we have precious little time today, uh, I'm only going to introduce them by their titles and we'll refer you to their online profiles to read more about them. Reginald Noel is an economist at the U.S. Department of Labor. Jordan Robert Axt is Assistant Professor of Psychology at McGill University and Director of Data and Methodology at Project Implicit. Anna Spain Bradley is Professor of Law and Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at UCLA. Professor, Bradley is, uh, Professor Spain Bradley is also the new Vice President of ASIL. And Ahilan uh, Arulanantham is professor from practice and co-faculty director of the Center for Immigration Law and Policy at the University of California at Los Angeles. Uh, we'll start with, with remarks from each of our roundtable members in the order in which I've just introduced them. First, Mr. Noel will uh, begin with outlining the economic challenges posed by structural racism. Second, Professor Axt will discuss the, psych the psychosocial challenges posed by structural racism. Third, Professor Spain Bradley will discuss the broad obligations imposed on the United States by CERD and other international human rights law instruments. And finally, Professor Arulanantham will discuss how these obligations might be operationalized by advocates. Afterwards, the roundtable members will engage with each other. And then finally, we'll open up to the audience for questions. Um, so Mr. Noel, you're first and the floor is, is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Reginald Well, and um, before I start, I just wanted to mention the fact that anything that I say are my views and not necessarily the views of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, nor the views of the Department of Labor. So I just want to get that out of the way so I don't get fined. But um, I did want to um, mention um, the economics behind uh, the fact that the Black Lives Matter movement uh, put a renewed spotlight on the unjust struggles of Black people and also uh, white privilege and white supremacy that exists in the US. And from an economic standpoint, uh, such disparities can be seen in income and wealth, uh, consumption patterns, uh, education, occupation, home ownership, and even marital status. So, um, with um, income, um, when I last checked, uh, annual wages and salaries are much lower for Black households uh, than the national average. Uh, the latest estimates from BLS say that the mean annual household income before taxes is approximately 83,000 nationally, but for Black households, it's uh, approximately 58,000. So that's essentially, I think, uh, 70 cents on the dollar, more or less. Uh, moreover, according to a uh, census, the Black population also has about 19% of people who are below the poverty line, as opposed to the national rate, which is 10.5%. Uh, and being the fact that we live in a capitalistic society, uh, this income can influence our choices and um, household spending. 
Um, so when we look at uh, consumption tendencies, um, budget, budget constraints are such that Black households are spending less amounts on pension and insurance, and they're more likely to live paycheck to paycheck and God forbid an emergency expense were to come up, um, this can be an economic devastation for their situation. Uh, the wealth gap is another thing that's interesting because uh, it's substantial, it's very big. Um, so when the Federal Reserve puts out the distribution of wealth, um, they show that white households account for approximately $103 trillion, as opposed to black households that only uh, comprise a $5 trillion of that wealth. And media tends to focus on this because of the fact that even if you have two households, black and white, that have the same annual income, uh, the fact of this wealth gap or having wealth allows them to accumulate more um, assets and pass those assets down to their children. And the, the important thing about this is um, wealth implies a, a constraint of time and also inheritance. And that tends to be something that's really big with respect to white privilege. Home ownership is another thing. Uh, approximately 70% um, of uh, white households are owning a home, whether with a mortgage or without, as opposed to 54% uh, of black households that are actually renting. So whenever people are making payments um, for white households, they're making payments towards equity. For black households, they're just making payments towards rent, and that doesn't build up any assets for them. Um, and once again, um, discriminatory practices like, um, for instance, redlining, you have predatory lending, and the evaluation of homes in predominantly black neighborhoods uh, contribute to these disparities that we speak about. Um, educational attainment, um, black people have lower educational attainment compared to white people. And even when they do have the same uh, education level, levels, set of paribus, um, they're, they're still making less than their white counterparts. Occupation is another thing. Uh, the latest national unemployment rate was 6.2% uh, with COVID and everything. That's how that was. Um, last year around this time or so, it was probably like three point or 3.1. But um, when you just, just aggregate that um, 6.2%, um, for white people, it's actually 5.6%. And for Black people, it's 9.9%. So um, that's another thing that uh, comes into play. And it's also known that when someone is employed, um, white men specifically tend to have uh, more um, corner offices, more CEO um, and manager and business roles, while Black men tend to have higher percentages in transportation and moving material roles. And um, I also wanted to talk about marital status. Um, marital, marriage is a way for two individuals to come together. They could coalesce their resources. And when I examine and extrapolate data looking at adults over 25 years and over, uh, the rates are really high for white people. And it's the marriage rate is around 60 to 70% as opposed to black people who have lower marriage rates between 30 and 40%. And um, there is a correlation between education and marriage rates, um, but it's also been shown that there's a uh, additional factors like um, the high rate of um, black men in prisons and the high unemployment rate um, um, towards um, black, in the black individuals that also depress these marriage rates. So um, I mentioned a lot of data, statistics, and things like that. Um, the, the, the main point I want to get to is that the stratification that occurs based upon race is um, was previously rationalized as a function of like social Darwinism and meritocracy. So basically, if someone's at the top, it's because they worked hard and they deserve it. And inversely, if someone is on uh, the bottom, so to speak, that's because they're somehow lazy and um, didn't work hard enough. And um, these ideologies are rather erroneous because uh, they lead to a perpetual cycle that creates these economic gaps. And it also leads to a mindset where some people may be seen as better or worse than others. So this is the thing where um, Black Lives Matter comes into play because once you have that mindset, um, it builds a narrative that some people are, the, I guess the value of one person's life versus another is different and that's um, quite frankly unfair. So um, the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, their protest around a new narrative 
um, dis deals, um, dismisses the draconian ways of thought and uh, the laws that uphold them. And they exemplify how white privilege make movements towards uh, equity extremely difficult. And um, we have to do things like this. We have to continue to unearth and address these systemic inequalities to move forward to a more fair society. That's my spiel, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Noel. Um, Professor Axt. Thank you for that um, summary, Mr. Noel, of all the different ways that you know, we live in a system where these inequalities exist. And as a professor of psychology, I'm gonna jump off of that point a little bit and talk about what is psychological research specifically related to uh, implicit bias and intergroup relations. What has it told us and is telling us from the last 30 or 40 years that might shed light on this issue of systemic racism? So I'll do my best to summarize those 40 years in about 10 minutes. Um, so there are a couple of points I'd like to make, and I will make as many of them as I can before my 10 minutes are up. Uh, the first one that I want to talk about is this idea of you know, being exposed to messages about uh, structural disparities and inequality can really, over time, automatically shape the way that our minds function. And I think one of the main insights from the research in social psychology over the last 25 years or so has been this distinction between explicit and implicit bias. So implicit bias is uh, a phrase that has a lot of different meanings to different people. But I'm gonna talk about it more narrowly in terms of the research I'm going to review and that I conducted is about uh, automatic associations that might exist in our mind that counter our conscious and uh, consciously endorsed beliefs. And so there's been a lot of very, thought-provoking studies over the last few years that show that people are aware of the status hierarchies that exist along race within uh, America. And so if you ask people who are Latinx, white, Asian, or black, you know, what are, how much status does this racial group have in American society? What you'll see is that there's a lot of consensus. People who, white people will say that white people uh, have the most status, followed by Asian and then black and Latinx. Uh, and then this pattern is not unique to white people. Asian and Black and Latinx participants will report the exact same pattern. But there is consensus on the degree to which um, people recognize these status hierarchies. But a large majority of people will reject them consciously. They will say, no, I don't support those status hierarchies. I don't support the degree of the system, systemic inequality that exists in our culture. I just recognize that it exists. And psychology has developed some tools for kind of seeing, well, what are the consequences from a psychological perspective of looking at of existing in a society that has these inequalities that you might not necessarily support, but that you're exposed to repeatedly. Um, one way that we do this is something called an implicit association test, where it's basically seeing how quick, how easy is it for you to pair faces from one racial group with positive versus negative words. And going way back in the cognitive psychology literature, we can infer that when it's easier for you to move through uh, blocks in this test. They allow for the same response for positive words and members of, say, uh, of white faces. And it's harder for you to move through blocks where it is um, positive words and black faces. We can infer that the, the concept of positivity in white is more strongly held together in your mind than positivity in black. And through Project Implicit, which is an online research laboratory that's been collecting data from these types of implicit association tests for many years now, we have over 10 million uh, participants, we can see that there is a remnant of this exposure to structural racism in people's implicit associations, such that even for, for example, Black participants, they will often have positive associations towards um, Black people, but their, their implicit evaluations of other people will be very much in line with social standing. So for example, among Black participants, an, an adapted version of the test, we'll see the most positive implicit associations for Black than uh, white, than Asian, than Latinx people. For Asian people, they'll have the most positive associations for Asian, but then followed by white, white and black, than Latinx. Uh, and so these are showing the repeated exposure to these systemic inequalities can really shape the way that your mind functions. Now that's not as if to say that the implicit association test is a lie detector or anything like that. We view it as more information and it's more subtle forms of information that these exposure to systemic inequalities can kind of creep in. And even though we might feel as if consciously we're rejecting these unequal systems, just living in a society that has them can change one's own individual psychology. And so that has really been an eye-opening development of research in psychology. 
And it's kind of led to this natural follow-up question of, well, how do we change the impact of these implicit or explicit biases? And, you know, it's not the most optimistic takeaway from a lot of the meta-analyses that are coming out recently, but it does seem that for many years, we devoted a lot of resources to testing interventions that can reduce someone's implicit biases or testing uh, uh, strategies of changing people's explicit biases. What are really, you know, persuasive arguments for reducing self-reported prejudice as well. And research that I've done, but also research uh, from, from separate groups has found that these implicit and explicit prejudices when targeted at the individual are very, very resistant to change. Uh, it's probably overly optimistic to think that a lifetime of exposure to certain ideas or uh, associations can be changed from just one or few messages. And we're seeing that creating long lasting terms of change from an individual level is very difficult. And so that is really pushing the field to focus more on not changing individual minds, but changing the context in which those minds operate. And so it's, we're seeing much more you know, bang for our buck and much more effectiveness of reducing discrimination when we change the systems in which those minds are operating to uh, allow for more uh, fair treatment or for allow for more objective evaluation, rather than focusing, focusing so much time and energy on changing individual minds. And so this is a real challenge for the field because it's much more difficult to, cha to you know, change an institution than it is to try and change an individual mind. But as we're learning, there's, there's really no an easy way out for addressing these issues. And so even though it's going to be much more difficult to target these interventions at changing institutions, that does just seem to be the necessary uh, direction. And with my uh, last few minutes here, I'll talk about one prominent way that people have been trying to address this that uh, might bring its own new perils that we're going to have to think about more and more as we try and find more advanced ways of addressing systemic racism. So a very common development that I've seen in many different areas is this idea of uh, algorithmic or machine learning approaches to combating discrimination. The idea here, if we can remove individual subjectivity from, for example, sentencing decisions so that they no longer uh, even use a defendant's race, for example, they're using what should, what should be more objective criteria for the case to determining sentencing. And that's a way of aligning all these uh, psychological biases that we might carry with us. And I agree that this is a noble approach in, in theory, but what we're seeing again and again as these studies come out is that you know garbage in, garbage out is another common refrain here, right? If we're using inputs into these algorithms that are themselves, while not necessarily using information like race, but are uh, using data that is reflecting racial disparities in terms of who's arrested or who's stopped, then really, even though it might appear on the surface to be unbiased, we're just reproducing these disparities because of the uh, flawed data that's going into them. So I just want to end my time by kind of uh, summarizing by saying that you know, the research in psychology has shown us that we're all subject to these biases and they're very hard to change. And so I'm hoping to use our time here today to think constructively about, well, how can we focus on a new level of analysis here, looking at ways of uh, addressing institutions rather than individual minds. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Axe. Uh, Professor Spain Bradley, please. Greetings everyone who've joined us today and thank you so much to Professor Felmuth and the leadership of the ASIL Human Rights Interest Group for organizing this roundtable. My remarks today are offered in my personal capacity and do not represent UCLA or any other institution of which I'm affiliated. So my part today is to take the conversation towards international law and international human rights law by considering what obligations does international human rights law impose on states with regard to the perennial fight against racism. But first, I find the need to center the conversation we're having today to note the full scope of the problem of racism that faces us in the world. Racism in all of its forms threatens the lives and the rights of millions of people around the world. And it has for far too long. Its many manifestations show up as Reginald has explained, as in economic ways, as poverty, political ways, as disenfranchisement, health disparities, threats to both national security and world peace. Racism knows no national boundaries. It is a global harm with global reach and global roots. It appears as ethnic cleansing, segregation, apartheid, colonialism, and more. It is structural, institutional, interpersonal, and as Jordan just explained, internalized in ways that we uncover through psychology, neuroscience, and other fields. The Black Lives Matter movement 
and the events, the very painful events of the last year have provided a necessary national and global spotlight on this aged ill. People, human beings, children, Trevon Martin, women, Breonna Taylor, men, George Floyd, should not have to die for awareness to be raised and rights to be protected. And yet that is what our history shows. To combat racism and indeed eliminate it as the surge treaty calls for, requires fully grasping and accepting racism's many manifestations and the full extent of its harms. Islamophobia, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, racism against indigenous peoples is rooted in a common ideology that some of us are supposedly inherently superior to others on the basis of race. Meanwhile, we must note that race as a category is a fiction. The United Nations declared this for all nations in the 1950 UNESCO report, The Race Question, that race has no basis in biology or scientific fact. In the United States, as is true as many parts of the world, the perpetuation of race thinking too often manifests as white supremacy, which FBI Director Christopher Wray reconfirmed just this month as a leading threat to our national security. Racial superiority as an ideology is a tool of oppression employed around the world that works by dehumanizing individuals and communities, not only by denying inherent equality and dignity, but doing so on the basis of a constructed category of race, a category designed to permanently elevate some and suppress many. This is what the important contributions from critical race theory and third world approaches to international law and other fields show us. It shows us racism is rendered invisible often by those who benefit from its social capital, economic power and political currency that comes when they exercise it as they use it to maintain places of power within social hierarchies. And finally, racism is the thief of dignity, a core tenant of human rights. So nations have tried to address this problem, most notably perhaps in 1965 with the formation of the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. CERD, as it's known, became the first universal human rights treaty to directly address racial discrimination. It entered into force in 1969. I think it's worth revisiting the conversations that nations and delegates had and noting how and why they got stuck. So, the representative Morozov, who was from the USSR at the time, stated, quote, racism and racial discrimination are such shameful and odious products of imperialism and colonialism that all peoples and all decent human beings are resoutly demanding that they be ended, end quote. This quote is notable because he named racism as part of the problem, distinct from racial discrimination. But at the end of the day, the treaty itself only frames the problem as one of racial discrimination, as we see in Article 1.1, and defines that as, quote, any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference based on race, color, descent, or national and ethnic origin, which has the purpose or effect of nullifying or impairing the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise on an equal footing of human rights and fundamental freedoms, end quote. So here we see the world's understanding as nations have agreed that the problem of racial discrimination must be linked to an act, a distinction, an exclusion, a restriction or preference that is also connected to purpose or effect. This vague language does not define race and instead expands its contextual reference to include color, descent, national origin or ethnic origin, but importantly, not nationality, which has come up in cases before the ICJ as of late. In writing this treaty that would outlaw racial discrimination, the drafters struggled to define the full extent of the, car, the harm. And they talked about um, how this could happen in some parts of the world, which gives plausible deniability to governments that it's not happening in their country or in their society, which we have seen time and time again. There's a further part of the, uh, the negotiation history that's really fascinating. And it goes to naming kinds of racism. And countries got into heated debate 
If you were going to name some kinds, you must name all. If it's this kind, it's also that kind. And that's a conversation that foretold many of the challenges we see today when we take up addressing racism in its global dimensions. Article two is where we find what the convention sets forth as obligations placed on states. It asks states to condemn racial discrimination and to undertake and pursue by appropriate means without delay, a policy of eliminating racial discrimination. It asks states to take effective measures in their laws. It asks, asks states to in, enact certain legislation and to encourage integrationist multiracial organizations and movements that can eliminate the barriers. Not too long ago, I was able to join a group of legal experts from around the world as we served the UN in Geneva at the Ad Hoc Committee on the Elaboration of Complementary Standards, which is a short, a long way of saying the body that helps look at how the CERD Treaty can be better implemented. And here we revisited the central problems faced in 1965 and some new ones. Nations are getting stuck around what does it mean? to hold a person or an institution, a government office accountable for an act of racism in their society. In the United States, we have federal legislation on hate crimes, which we've had to revisit recently because of the uptick and rise of hate crimes across America. Other nations don't make such a distinction in their national law. And we talked a lot about, should, should this be something that the treaty itself asks of nations? Online speech and harms, showing up in Zoom bombings, use of racial slurs, questions about freedom of speech, economic challenges, the continued health disparities we see with COVID-19. All of these questions are challenges that nations struggle in a common way to address, in part because we still lack global consensus about what is and what is not racism, who is and who is not responsible when it occurs? How do we understand the harm so that we might make reparations possible? And perhaps an even more fundamental question about what is the appropriate focal point? Should it even be on racism or should it be on the underlying ideology of racial superiority that drives acts and behavior and words that we call racism? There are some areas of promise for change. And here I'll mention four that we can talk about later. Education. Of course, when racism occurs, there's a call for education. But for important reasons based in the latest uh, research on how people's brains impacts our behavior, we must move education from passive trainings to robust experiential education that changes behavior by changing neural pathways in our brain, our memory, our experiences, and our associations. Accountability is number two. What are the appropriate forms for accountability? Truth-telling, apology, consequences, sanctions, loss of privileges, loss of job, reparations. There are many under international law and we have to figure out which ones are most effective to fight the challenge of racism. There also have to be avenues of return, ways that people who do wrong or institutions or structures that do wrong can make amends and return to the community. Third, communication. We have to have these conversations like the one we're trying to have today. They are difficult, but they are most necessary if we're going to enact change. And finally, fourth, we must end racism by preventing it from arising in our hearts, minds, and ways of life. And prevention may be our greatest challenge. In the discussion, I hope we can talk about how there's a problem underneath that of racism. This innate human need to organize ourselves by hierarchy. And unless we as 8 billion people can find another way for human organization, we will not fully reach eliminating racism in the first instance. Thank you. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Spain Bradley. Professor Arulanantham. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for having me. Um, and thanks to Professor Spain Bradley, particularly for highlighting the profound harm that racism causes. I want to talk about some of those in a little more specific way. Over the last 20 years, I have litigated human rights cases in United States courts, mostly focusing on immigrant communities and racial minority groups targeted by the federal government. 
most of the practices and legal rules I have challenged probably would not exist in a world of racial equality, um, a world free of humans organizing themselves in hierarchies as Professor Spain Bradley describes. Um, but I will admit, having litigated to try to, to challenge these, I am barely conversant in most international law. Uh, and I think a very unlikely candidate for a panel at this conference, because it's rare that litigants can obtain enforceable judicial relief in the US under treaties that have not been incorporated into domestic law, like the CERD. Um, so I wanna offer some suggestions for how we might change that uh, and use as an illustration a case that I've worked on uh, for the last several years. Ramos v. Wolf, and now Mayorkas, uh, is a challenge to the Trump administration's attempt to strip the immigration status of 400,000 non-white, non-European immigrants in the United States, most of whom have lived here lawfully for nearly 20 years under a program known as Temporary Protected Status. Krista Ramos, the lead plaintiff in the case, is a U.S. citizen. She's actually a high school student in the Bay Area whose mother is a TPS holder from El Salvador. And Krista was born here, has lived here her whole life. But if the TPS terminations go into effect, then her mother will have to leave. And Krista will then have to either separate from her mother uh, as a teenager or leave the US, effectively surrendering the primary benefits of citizenship. I think it's a, a perfectly good example of the kinds of harms that we talk about when we think about racism. Um, now, the TPS statute was enacted in 1990 to regularize the system for humanitarian admissions into the United States. It creates criteria by which the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security can, at their discretion, grant protection from deportation to people who are in the U.S. Um, so long as their home countries face war, natural disaster, or another set of humanitarian crises that are described in the statute. Once established, a TPS designation lasts for 6, 12, or 18 months, and it's renewable indefinitely. In fact, the statute requires the TPS must be renewed if the ground conditions warranting designation persist. Now, for those thinking about this from a refugee protection perspective, I should mention that TPS really differs from asylum and its related protections because TPS doesn't involve any individualized determination that someone may face persecution. It's an entirely nationality-based form of protection. Now, historically, many countries have had TPS designations for short periods. Um, some may here may remember the Ebola epidemic during the Obama administration, and there were short TPS grants to some countries from West Africa during that time. But a few countries have had it for a long time. As of 2016, when Trump took office, about 400,000 people had had TPS for more than a decade, including 350,000 people from El Salvador and Honduras since 2003, almost 60,000 Haitians since 2010, and the longest group, 1,400 people from Sudan, most of whom had had TPS since 1997. And surprisingly, those very long-time lawful residents have something like 300,000, excuse me, unsurprisingly, uh, 300,000 U.S. citizen children, uh, most of whom are schooled, uh, like Krista Ramos you know, in, in school right now. Now, anti-immigrant advocacy groups have long targeted this population in particular for attack. Uh, two I'll mention, the Center for Immigration Studies and the Federation for American Immigration Reform, both of whom explicitly oppose legal immigration because it threatens white European American culture um, and have been described as hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center, both of them had called for restricting TPS so that no one could have it for more than about three years. So it wasn't surprising then that when people from those groups, and that's why I mentioned them, from those groups went to work on immigration policy in the Trump administration, hired into the government, they implemented this policy vision. And sure enough, by early 2018, the Trump administration had issued decisions terminating TPS for 98% of the people who had held that status in 2016, all of whom were non-white, non-European immigrants. Now, in challenging this, we might have been able to show the racist motivation behind these decisions just at the outset of the case based on that history alone, what I've described. But it became a lot easier when President Trump was asked by a, bar by a partisan group of senators to consider an immigration deal that they had struck that would have granted permanent residence to the TPS holder population. And in response, he said, why are we having all these people from shithole countries coming here? Why can't we have more people from countries like Norway? And as I'm sure you all know, 
that was not the the first racist statement he had made against people from these countries. He had already had said that all Haitians have AIDS, so they should be taken out of any immigration deal. Uh, he had called Central American refugees animals. Uh, he had made too many statements about Muslims to mention so many. Um, and so in March of 2018, we filed suit challenging the terminations of TPS for these countries, arguing that the decisions violated the US Constitution, specifically the, prohibi the prohibition on in intentional race discrimination. Now courts have read the Fifth Amendment to prohibit race discrimination, um, but it requires proof of an intent to discriminate in the mind of the decision maker or in the minds of the people who influence the decision. Um, in addition, you have to show that the discriminatory, the discriminatory intent was a motivating factor in the decision. In addition, the government argues, and they argued in our case, that proof standards should be even higher when the government acts pursuant to its immigration or foreign policy powers. Now, as problematic as um, Sir it is, as Professor Brain, uh, Spain Bradley had, had described, I would have loved to raise the claim under the convention um, because by its terms, it is actually far more rigorous in its anti-discrimination protections than is federal constitutional law. Article two, paragraph one C prohibits regulations. This is actually the, um, one of the um, passages you quoted, which have the effects, effects of creating or perpetuating racial discrimination wherever it exists. So unlike the Fifth Amendment, this doesn't necessarily require that you probe into the minds and hearts of the decision makers to prove discrimination. And wherever it exists, I would argue, probably prohibits exceptions uh, or you know, quasi exceptions for immigration or foreign policy contexts. Also, with respect to the president's statements in particular, you know, Article 4, Paragraph C provides that state parties shall not permit public authorities to promote or incite racial discrimination. And Article 2, Paragraph 1E provides each state, each state party undertakes to discourage anything which tends to strengthen racial division. And just on their face, these seem tailor-made to require some form of redress for the president's statements. But in practice, as I'm sure you all know, uh, because U.S. law treats treaties as non-self-executing, a doctrine that itself grew out of an attempt to avoid accountability for race discrimination, uh, as J. Ramji Nogales and others have uh, described, you generally can't sue federal or state governments under the convention itself, certainly not for a preliminary injunction if you're trying to get fast relief, which is what we are trying to do here. I mean, that's true even though Article 6 specifically requires that state parties make their national tribunals available to remedy any acts of racial discrimination contrary to this convention. So we were stuck with the Fifth Amendment. Um, as it turned out, the judges we drew apparently viewed our race discrimination challenge as a close question. We won it at the trial court level in October 2018. A judge issued an injunction that stopped all the TPS terminations just weeks before the Sudan termination was going to go into effect. But the government appealed that. In a two to one decision, a panel of Ninth Circuit judges reversed our lower court victory. We, in turn, sought full court or what they call on bank review of that decision. And our petition for on bank review was pending when the election happened. The Biden campaign had promised to protect TPS holders. The president had said it it's on their website. Uh, so the government, uh, the court gave the government 60 days to tell them what action do you intend to take on this matter before we decide this rehearing petition. And that deadline runs on April 19th. And thus far, they have taken no action. Nothing has happened. Um, and I feel obligated to mention here that some of my clients from a group called the National TPS Alliance are, as we speak, engaged in a 43-day rotating hunger strike, demanding protection for themselves and their families um, um, right now. I still believe we'll prevail one way or the other. Um, I'm sort of an optimist. You kind of have to do that, um, you know, to, to do this kind of work, I suppose. You know, but stepping back, you have to marvel, right, how difficult it has been to challenge a policy that came straight out of the playbook of a set of white supremacist organizations and was actually described that way in profane language by the president. So with this story in mind, I just, I just want to close by you know, returning to that question. How might we operationalize the convention's protections to make it useful in cases like this? And say there's a lot of ways we could do it. You know, the Biden administration has said that racial justice legislation is one of its most important priorities, um, but I haven't heard of a campaign to make domestic legislation implementing the convention a part of that effort. Uh, the BREATHE Act, 
truly visionary legislation created by the Movement for Black Lives uh, does not mention the CERD, uh, and it could, I think, uh, redress or effective remedies for race discrimination might require, for example, eliminating qualified immunity in cases of race discrimination or, motivated, or racially motivated violence. You know. Then the last thing I'll just briefly mention, legislation aside, and everyone knows legislation is hard, the filibuster and all that, um, the Biden, Biden administration could take steps entirely on its own to make the convention a living reality, at least for the federal government. It could issue an executive order that the federal government would comply with the convention. That would make it actionable in court. Individual departments like Homeland Security could write a memorandum that bound themselves to the CERD, and that would make it actionable under the Administrative Procedures Act and people could sue over it. And steps like that um, would protect the TPS holders and many others besides. And I think that would be a fitting beginning to a new world, you know, one in which attorneys like me would view the convention as essential knowledge for litigating anti-discrimination cases in US courts. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit um, as we proceed here now too. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Arula Nantham. Um, so now we're going to have direct engagement um, between or among our, um, our panelists here. Um, so please uh, you know, uh, feel free to ask questions to each other or respond to points that have already been raised. I'd like to go first. Reginald. Sure. Mr. Noel, sorry. No, that's fine. It's totally fine. Um, so uh, obviously I'm more of an economist, so I see numbers and I think of things in terms of like quantities and quantifying things. But um and and when when we have um institutions or we have people or even like governments that engage in um biased activity. Um, I, I assume, I mean, living in a capitalistic society, the best way to penalize them is through like money, through like monetary. That's just the blood life of a capitalistic society. Um, I, I hear people talk about this idea of uh, like reparations in, in terms of like coming as like a, a way to like have institutions to be able to pay back um, for the wrongs that they've done. And I've, I've seen that there's been some schools actually universities have done it. Um, but I also realized or thought, you could correct me if I'm wrong, I thought that um, the U.S. apologized for slavery, but they also put like an asterisk saying like you can't be sued based upon that. And I was just thinking about with respect to like on litigation, just like if they do open themselves up to be prosecuted based upon that, would that be a way where um, people could kind of seek a retribution for the things that they've experienced? Is that, was that question directed to uh, Helen or uh, Professor Lenantham or, uh, or just generally? Uh, yeah, it was more of a general thing. It was, it was more idle thought. Like I'm working on this kind of like um, guidelines to reparations. And um, that was just one of those things where I just couldn't figure out on my, with my little economic brain, so. Before someone does respond, I would just note that Evanston, Illinois, uh, home of Northwestern University has now, um, initiated the first ever reparations program in, in the United States. Um, so there, there are, um, it, you know, really fascinating developments on this, on this topic. Would anybody like to respond to Mr. Noel? I'm happy to start and then um, I'm sure that um, Anna will want to jump in. Um, yeah, I should say uh, it's the first reparations program with respect to uh, enslavement, right? But there's reparations for people um, um, Japanese Americans in the and, and I think um, non-nationals as well in the internment and you know, there there have been um, other kind of uh, programs. I think. Sorry, that's what I, I meant. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no worries. Um, yeah, I think I, I think there's a a general concept in law, the statute of limitations, which bars claims that are too old. Um, and uh, then there's a bunch of things about um, when those claims can be moved around, uh, can be can be brought forward, notwithstanding that. And that's something that that. Um, that people can address through legislation. So um, one thing you could do is enact a, a law that just that waived that statute uh, and then allowed people to sue um, over it. Um, but there's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different ways that um, reparations could be implemented through law. It's not like there's some sort of, you know, categorical barrier making it impossible. Uh, it really has to do a lot with like how the policymakers or, um, you know, people involved in it choose to structure it to allow it um, to allow it to occur. Do you want to, I'm sure you, I don't know if 
Professor Spam Bradley, if, if you want to jump in, or, or it's sort of a question following on Reginald that I would have for you. Do you do you think when it talks about when the convention talks about redress um, and effective remedies, do you think it kind of implies the possibility of reparation, and is that part of the reason why um, there's been hesitation about defining that um, in some way? A great question, and I think you know take both of your conversations to the following place. Uh, whenever we're having discussions about something as old, as complex, as global, um, as horrific as racism, there's so much going on in the conversation that I think we can step back and say, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And here, one of the problems, you know, blatantly put on display yesterday when uh, Georgia State Representative Park Cannon was arrested as she was knocking on the door uh, and to enter into uh, the legislative assembly. You know, when we take that through Fifth Amendment, we take that through CERD, and we take that through law writ large, and we say, how do we understand what happened? How do we adjudicate who was right and who was wrong? How do we understand the human rights implication of the affront to her human dignity in that moment? How do we understand the intent in the mental, cognitive, emotional spaces of the two individuals who made the decision to arrest her. Uh, all of that, people give a name to. People say that was racism. And we can add gender discrimination, we can add other things in there. And when we try to grapple with that, our systems for understanding harms and remedies, reparations and prevention get really stuck because again, I keep going back to this fundamental two points. People don't agree in this country, especially in most of the world, what is racism? And part of the problem is we don't agree on what race is. And we know it's completely made up in the sense that it's not biological. Uh, and we also know that it's been used for a long time to separate us into groups. And that's part of our lived experience. And the second point there is that, you know, this is a nod to the late, great Derek Bell, first African-American professor at Harvard Law School, um, faces at the bottom of the well. There will always be those in society who are at the bottom. And in our society, in America, we can give name to that. And one of the groups consistently at the bottom are Black people in this country, always. And women and people who don't identify uh, in traditional gender or sexual orientation ways that have been accepted. There are lots of us at the bottom. And what we want to avoid is a competition among ourselves of who's at the bottom fighting for, you know, this harm is worse than that harm and look at the structure itself and look at those both institutionally and beyond who benefit from the structure. So no matter if we have a little tweak on the Fifth Amendment interpretation in court or if we reevaluate the definition of uh, what constitute racial discrimination under CERD, we're still dealing with a structure that serves. And I think that's what I hear in my work, in my day-to-day -day experience, uh, trying to really hold people accountable for discrimination. Um, people want change and they want this whole dance of denying the, the inherent fact that racism is part and parcel of all things in America they want that to change. And yet getting to change is something we haven't quite achieved. And that's where we're all getting stuck. And that's where we're all having conversations. What would really shift this forward? And I'll just conclude with one of my favorite quotes of all time from Ralph Ellison, whatever else America is, it is also somehow black. And I probably messed up that quote, but you know, we get the point. Uh, so as much as we're, we're conver conversing, I think I would love for the brilliant minds here to think about where, do you, where does your area in your field with the people that you interact with, where do people get stuck? And is there anything you can think of that would push things forward? Jordan, uh, Professor Actian, maybe uh, would you like to take that up to tell us a little bit more about your field of psychology? Uh, sure, uh, that was very well put as a nice closing note, so I'm a little hesitant to jump in after that. But uh, if I could take a psychological lens to, I think, this broader discussion about maybe changes in legislation. Uh, one thing that I've been very interested in seeing over the last few years in psychological research is this bi-directional relationship between uh, perceptions of social norms and changes in attitudes and beliefs. I think it's common for people to feel like 
you know, elect, people elect representatives that reflect their attitudes and beliefs, and then that enacts legislation that's more in line with that. And that's certainly the way it works. Maybe not the most efficient process all the time, but that is how it works. But it does seem like people also look to the legislation or the norms put forth by the institutions around them to infer what social norms are more broadly acceptable within that society. Uh, there's a great analysis from uh, Professor Betsy Pollack at Princeton looking at really just the days after the, I believe, Ober Obergefell versus Hodges decision that uh, recognized same-sex marriage at a federal level. And you can track people in the days before and the days after. And really, even if it's only a handful of people deciding about you know, the re recognition of same-sex marriage on the Supreme Court, you see a huge jump just in a matter of days and the people, the amount of people, the degree to which people now perceive culturally uh, that same-sex marriage is normatively acceptable. And so people are really looking to the institutions around them as a way of inferring their own norms and values. And so for that, from that psychological perspective, I see a lot of value in uh, more institutions coming out and, and recognizing these disparities. Let me, uh, let me bring in some questions from the audience. Um, so the first one I think is probably most directed at uh, professors Spain Bradley and uh, Rulan Anthem. Um, what do you think are the best and most realistic ways of using uh, international human rights law and advocacy in the United States, given uh, you know, the country's exceptionalism um, to grapple uh, with racism and inequality? Professor Spain, Spain Bradley, would you like to go first? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll nod to Jordan's last point uh, that one of the powerful things in America is, is norm setting. And human rights law, international law, you know, for all of the ways that it doesn't force nations to do things all of the time, um, it does set norms. It sets new ways of understanding the human project and I'm, there's, in 2019, I published a piece called Human Rights Racism, and I'm going to reference a study there that I'm forgetting the, the name of. But there was a study done across the world of in what societies do people feel comfortable raising racial discrimination and their rights under human rights. And the United States fared highest on the list of the group study because of the civil rights movement, because we have a national narrative that it is wrong to be racist. It is wrong. Uh, to uphold racism in your structures, in your, in your companies, in your uh, government institutions. And that norm, you know, for all the reasons Jordan mentioned and more, changes behavior because it changes minds and attitudes and memories and associations about what we can and cannot do and how we should treat each other. Uh, and just as a nod, we're struggling with COVID-19 because we have yet to have a national narrative around simple things like wearing a mask uh, to keep yourself and others safe. And so, you know, we see this in other forms and fashion as well, but I think the power of international law and international human rights law for this country in particular is in shifting the dialogue, not towards should we, but of course we should, let's think about how. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I think in just even another example, the um, President Trump's statements about Asian Americans you know, at the start of the coronavirus, I think you can see a direct correlation to the rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans in this time period. So norm setting in both positive and negative, I feel like it, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, I, I, I do think also, you know, even if you can't sort of solve the systemic problem, you can protect individual people and protect their lives and make their lives better, improve their economic uh, outlook and things like that through other kinds of interventions, which are sort of incrementalist and have a, a positive effect. Um, I think people, uh, scholars have written about how states and local governments can adopt human rights treaties. Some cities have actually have um, adopted the CEDAW, the, the um, uh, Convention on Elimination Disc Discrimination Against Women, um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, I don't think anyone has done the third, as far as I know. Um, and I'm not sure why they, I mean, they, they clearly could, you know, the state and local governments could do that. That's a, a kind of an easier ask than trying to, you know, um, and, and, you know, get, get the federal government to do everything all at once. States as well, you know, sometimes in certain political contexts, things happen and states are tripping over themselves to look uh, politically progressive. And in those moments, I think it's, it's uh, another way that in which you could operationalize, um, uh, use human rights all that way. There's also been some really interesting writing about um, using human rights um, treaties defensively, even if you can't bring a lawsuit about it, that you could use it as a defense against, for example, a criminal prosecution. 
um, Robin Geis wrote this piece about um, using it in death penalty cases where the Supreme Court made it sort of impossible to challenge race discrimination, even though there's overwhelming statistical evidence that there's um, race discrimination in the implementation of the death penalty. I think something similar might be possible in, in actually immigration, illegal entry and re-entry prosecutions. So I think there's a lot of different ways in which it can be used. And I think some of those may work in court and some of them may not, but I think all of them by pushing it help to also push the norm and, and educate um, judges and other decision makers. Thank you, Professor Rulanantham. Um, another question from the audience, and this one I think is probably more directed towards Mr. Noel. Um, you had mentioned earlier uh, reparations. Um, on the larger topic of transitional justice in the United States, um, you know, what do you what do you think of the potential or prospect um, for such systems, which have been successfully used overseas, but less so um, in the United States? Not just reparations, but also, for example, truth commissions. Um, this has been a hot topic uh, within the American Society of International Law, as well as uh, other legal groups. Um, you know, what do you what do you see sort of as the path forward, if any, um, for these kind of creative, uh, uh, you know, approaches that that have been used overseas, but but not so much uh, domestically? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think we need to start getting uh, very creative with um, how we kind of deal with these things. Um, I feel like uh, the government has a um, federal government, at least, and state governments for that matter, have an obligation towards um, putting more towards the public good. Um, you have individuals that pay their taxes and do things like that. And in that uh, relationship with the government, the government's supposed to provide protection, but also public goods. So uh, things like uh, health care, uh, things like um, main, making sure that people are able to get um, um, live, like a living wage or things like uh, people be able to get housing. So um, I think there might be there might be a need for us to kind of like go through on um, different channels in order to bring about um, a bolstering of this like public good. Um, I for one am for uh, essentially um, businesses and organizations that have made billions off of like the public good of the United States. You think about the roads, you think about the people who are purchasing their products and things. I think they need to give back and more so than just as a tax write off. I think there needs to be ways where they put money out there, maybe have a committee that's able to like take these monies and research where these uh, funds can be allocated efficiently. Um, overall, we have to like change our national uh, statistics. The national statistics when it comes to wage, um, discrimination against women, they've been fairly consistent um, since, I don't know, 1950s. So I think that's something we need to uh, address. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Noel. Um, another question from, from the audience. Um, this one's probably directed towards, uh, again, Professor Zarula Nantham in, in Spain Bradley. Um, the questioner identifies that CERD Article 7 requires states to combat, quote, prejudices that lead to racial discrimination, end quote, particularly in, quote, teaching, education, culture, and information, end quote. That article goes beyond laws to work to, quote, change the heart, end quote. Um, so the question from the questioner is, do you know if CERD has done work more recently to promote this work, the work of changing the heart? So I will, uh, first of all, great question to whoever asked it. And this Article 7 came up in the discussions of the ad hoc committee that I mentioned before at the last session that I was a part of. Uh, and you know, there, so there's a call writ large for education and a recognition that in 2021, education means something quite different than how it was previously considered you know, as a training or a course, but something much more uh, experiential, basically. But no, I mean, there's no, there's no global consistency across nations enacting certain programs. Uh, I think for all the reasons that Jordan and I and others in the space of neuroscience, psychology, behavioral science are showing, if you want to change behavior, you have to change a lot more than, you know, the traditional conception of, quote, rational thought. And that's where the heart comes in, uh, that people are very motivated, we are very motivated by emotion in all of its forms. And it's in motivation, not just in our heart, in our emotional space, but in our brains, uh, so I think this is where, you know, the conversation is heading. I don't think that nations have yet a clear platform or framework 
for how Article 7 should take place in the world today. Um, and it's certainly an area for much more robust research and discussion and ideas and creative thought going forward. Thank you. Um, regrettably, we can't go over time. We have 10 seconds left. Um, so I just want to very quickly say thank you so much to all of our panelists, um, all of our speakers today, and please join us to continue the conversation uh, through that Zoom link um, that's available on the online program. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a good rest of the day.